So much so that it is better for you to enter heaven with no eyes, no feet, no legs. Call me torso man. It's better to be a torso in heaven than to have all your members and burn in hell for the rest of your lives. That's what he's saying. Can I say it more violently? He doesn't. Hacking your foot off is violent. Ripping your eye from his socket is violent. Taking an ax to your hand is violent. Is he giving a prescription to go lop off members? No, he's drawing a, a juxtaposition between two things, heaven and hell, eternity and life or in death. And he wants to get your attention. So much so that he says, look at your hand, cut it off. Somebody tell me that our rabbi is not serious and tell me you can make that mean something else. We are in our rabbi series. I'm actually part nine. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, part 12. A little behind. Uh, part 12 of our rabbi series today. We've, we've done 11 of them. Um, and so we're going to continue talking about the life, the events, the miracles, um, these moments that are the life of Jesus, the rabbi, the Mashiach, the Messiah, a first century teacher who taught like a Pharisee in parable form, a first century teacher who aligned with that line of thinking and the resurrection of the dead and conversations about life beyond this world. And that's what we're going to do today. And the title of this message is Inferno. Inferno, taken from the poem or book written by the poet Dante in Dante's Inferno. Dante's Inferno is this nine circle descent to the center of the earth. And on those nine levels in Dante's book, Dante's Inferno, you're descending to the center or the core of the earth where Satan dwells. Now, this is not biblical. It's very, 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 very loosely based on biblical uh, concepts, but I bring that up today to just broach the subject of eternity, of life beyond this world. So is it like Dante prescribes this poet that says we start at the first level and we descend to the second, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, all the way down to the ninth where Satan dwells. And as you get to the center of the earth, the evil becomes more potent. That's the concept of Dante's Inferno. Now, is it biblical? No. <laughs> very, very loosely has some biblical principles in it. But today we open up the conversation of eternity and life beyond this world in a message called Inferno in Rabbi Part 12 as we look at Jesus and his teachings on hell. So let me read to you a, uh, an excerpt just to give you some of, the, some of the sensationalism that is out there concerning death. This is um, from Maurice Rawlings, Behind Death's Door. Each time he regained a heartbeat and respiration, the patient screamed, I am in hell. He was terrified and pleaded with me to help him. I was scared to death. Then I noticed a genuinely, genuinely alarmed look on his face. He had a terrified look worse than the expression seen in death. This patient had a grotesque grimace, experiencing sheer horror. His pupils were dilated and he was perspiring and trembling. He looked as if his hair was on fire. Then still another strange thing happened. He said, don't you understand? I am in hell. He was indeed in trouble. He was in panic like I had never seen before. Here is a, an account, a first person account of someone who is passing from death to life, passing from this life to the next. And this is what he's experiencing, this individual experience that's dying, that's passing beyond death's door. He's commenting on what he's seeing, and in his eyes, he's seeing hell. Now, I don't share this as our text today and that we're going to build some theology off this. I simply share this to awaken us to the, sh the, the terror of what the concept of hell is and to begin the conversation about what it looks like beyond this world. Is that real? Did this guy really see hell? Did he really see the devil? I don't know. 
I don't know. Anytime someone is commenting on near-death experiences, life after death, if someone tells you they went to heaven, talked to Jesus, question that a lot. Um, they probably didn't. Did they? Jesus knows. But there's a lot of people out there claiming they've, they've done things like that that are not true. So I don't bring this up to sensationalize this topic, but I do bring it up to show you the world's fear on this topic. And that it is something we think about even though we push it down until the next funeral we attend. Till the next time that we peer beyond the void and we think about eternity. To the next time we're sitting camping under the stars and we look up at the heavens and we just ponder our, our situation and how small we are and how vast the universe is. And our heart longs for something eternal. So here is this conversation. Did this guy see hell? I don't know. But there is a hell. Matter of fact, we live in a day and age that wants to erase hell. It's a book called Erasing Hell um, in response to Rob Bell's book, which is called Love Wins. So there's this idea that we, we don't like judgment. And let me be the first to raise my hand. I don't enjoy speaking on judgment. I don't, I don't even like the concept of it. I don't understand his judgment. I don't understand the idea of, of eternal damnation. I don't. Let me be honest with you. I grapple with it, man. I want there to be some other answer than the, than the reality that it, it appears to me to be in Scripture that speaks of an eternal life beyond this world that either ends in bliss or in torment. And if that is true, why is it spoken on so rarely? You know why? Because we don't want to believe it. Matter of fact, there are people like Rob Bell who have desperately tried to disprove it. But as you're going to see this morning, as we hear from the rabbi himself, speak on an eternal life beyond this world and on damnation and punishment. He speaks on it. The rabbi, Jesus. So it would behoove us to stop for a minute when considering his teachings to, to highlight the reality of his teachings on eternity and hell. In Rob Bell's book, he says love wins in the end. Ultimately, everybody is saved. It's not what the Bible says. It's not what it says. I know you want to believe that, Rob Bell. I want to believe that. That's not what the Bible says. So what do we do? Do we explain it away because we can't understand God? My friend, you'll never understand him. Have you considered the solar systems? Have you postulated the galaxies? He is a star-breathing God. And so we don't redefine what he says. We hear what he says. And we should do that in fear and trembling because the, the beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of God. You can't even start on the journey and you, unless you start with a healthy, reverent fear of who he is, of how big he is and how small we are. So what does the world think about uh, this idea of hell? If we're trying to explain it away, matter of fact, um, People that do that, you, you'll start to sense it in their teachings. Um, the Bible Project is one of those um, groups that is really teetering on the line when it comes to this. Because they desperately don't want to believe in the judgment and the wrath of God. Therefore, they remove the wrath of God. And removing the wrath of God, you must remove the wrath of God as displayed on the Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. They will label it cosmic child abuse. In their own rationale, they will say, well... What kind of father punishes his son for the sin of humanity? Well, apparently, the kind of God that wrote this book. So do you want to redefine him or do you want to read him as he says he is? So they will label terms like cosmic child abuse because like, they have to remove judgment from everything and wrath from everything. So they will remove it even from the sacrifice of Isaac on Mount Moriah. They'll say that Abraham failed the test. <laughs> While Hebrews praises Abraham for passing the test. Why? Because they're trying to eliminate the wrath of God. And if you eliminate it, you have to eliminate it everywhere, especially in regards to the Son and the punishment on the cross. It's what you call penal substitutionary atonement, a theological term that he took our place. And the wrath of the almighty God was laid on his back. 
You take that away? You take the heart out of the gospel? Jesus says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are there that find it. We should stop at those moments and say, search my heart, God, and know me. Test me and know me. So what does the world think about hell? Well, the Jehovah, Jehovah, excuse me, Jehovah's Witness, they believe in what's called mankind's common grave. Grave, like the grave you're buried in six feet deep. You'll hear there, this common conversation that they have. It's called mankind's common grave. That death itself is hell. That not existing is hell. Which I concur to some degree, but not to the gra- gravity of what Jesus paints hell as. But I would concur that that's a, a portion of it. So Jesus is speaking of hell. Um, Jehovah's Witness say that it's mankind's common grave, that it's just death, that, that ultimately um, you can um, receive their belief system um, and come out of that common grave. It's the Jehovah's Witness belief, but they do believe in a punishment and the punishment would be dying and not existing anymore. Well, let's just skip right to the atheist then. The atheist doesn't believe that there is a God. I believe they do. Um, They're just suppressing the truth, as the Bible says, because the fool has said in his heart there is no God, because a thoughtful design requires a thoughtful creator, that this building didn't just appear. It's pretty common sense. But professing to be wise, they became fools. And so we understand that there is a God and that he loves us and he is for us. So that's the Jehovah's Witness, mankind's common grave. We can have freedom from that grave and that portion of hell through Christ's sacrifice. The, um, the atheists believe that you don't exist. So that in a point, I want you to stop just for a minute and think about that. Just not existing. Not existing. You die. Your kids You have a boy, he raises up, marries a wife, they decide not to have kids, your line stops right there or three or four generations later and you're gone, no one remembers you, you don't remember yourself (laughs) because you don't exist. Chew on it. That is a form of hell as well. (laughs) A form of, of, of pain and loss and a, a... not existing, is that, is that the reward? Now, for some of us who have lived in true hell of addiction, now I use this, I'm using, using this hell somewhat liberally today, so bear with me as we look at how Jesus defines it. But are you, do you believe in God? Do you believe that he is, that he exists? If you don't, is that a hell in and of itself? But there, I can remember back being in addiction being in that place where really wanting the relief of not existing. Like even that form of, of pain and, and, and anguish of not existing um, compared to being in the pain and anguish of, anguish of true addiction and feeling like that would be a relief. And I know we've been there, many of us contemplating suicide. So we talk about hell and this idea of pain and, and judgment. Well, that's the atheists. How do, what do the Hindus believe? The Hindus believe in reincarnation, that, that you're reincarnated over and over again into greater life forms. So you were reincarnated from lesser life forms. At one point, you were a, an ant, a fly, a rat. Um, you graduated to a dog. Then it's eventually, as the dog, you learned your lessons and you graduate it's in the next life to be a panther. I don't know. Um, <laughs> just making stuff up now. You get the point. You, you learn as that. So what they do is they hold all those things sacred. So in India, where they believe in Hinduism, they're starving to death while ribeyes walk down the road next to them. While f- fillets and... Come on, somebody. Put some grilled shrimp on it. Just starving to death. Brahma cattle walking right by them. Starving like they are. Everyone's starving. Because they believe that that is an ancestor, and they must be kind. They have something called rat, the Rat Temple. It's a place I want to visit when, we, when it comes to our apologetic series, Words from the World, um, where I want to film in front of the Rat Temple, where they, they honor these rats because these rats are their ancestors. So I want you to think about that for a minute. You know, Grandpa, you know, Lowell, sis, that's my grandpa. I mean, they really believe that. They're not sure which rat's him. <laughs> he might be in another country as a... As, <laughs> As a mouse in my house, because I've got a couple that I've been trying to kill. 
But you get the point, like that's it. And in this temple, they set out milk for these rats. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of monster rats crawling in and out of beams and holes and going up to these dishes of milk that they put out for them. Hundreds of rats just circled around it drinking. It's going to be the coolest thing to video. <laughs> but it's crazy, right? It's, it's a wild concept. But that is their form of hell, that you're born as a rat. Therefore, they're kind to all these lesser forms of life. Um, and that's their form of hell would be coming back as some lesser form. That would really suck. Being reborn as a fly, you're alive for one day. Life's over. Did you learn your lessons that day to elevate to the, to, to the next stage? No, you didn't. As a fly, you failed. Now you're going to be a maggot. Good luck. Anyway, reincarnation, Hinduism, Buddhism. They believe in temporary purging in different chambers until pure. This is the Muslim belief system that, I'm sorry, the, the Buddhist system is that, um, Muslim is very similar, that, you're, that you go through chambers similar to what Dante's Inferno would describe, these nine layers, but it wouldn't be nine layers in this case. Um, but we have the, the Buddhists who believe that there are different chambers and you're temporarily punished and you go to one chamber to the next and once you learn your lesson there, you go to the next chamber. That is the Buddhist construct. Muslims believe in torture chambers as well until you receive Islam. And so during that process, you will uh, recant and receive um, the, the prophet Allah and, and, and you, uh, um, the prophet Muhammad. Following the, pro, uh, the God Allah, you will learn that in those chambers until you repent and you convert into the Muslim belief system. That's the Muslims. Mormons believe that, that hell is temporary. Judaism believes it's different. Judaism is strange in that regard. Um, there is factions of Judaism that believe in, in eternity. And there are factions of Juda Judaism that don't. The best way to see that in the Gospels are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Another way, Jesus aligns more with the teaching of the Pharisees than he does the Sadducees because he talks about resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees don't even believe in resurrection of the dead, um, not because they don't believe in resurrection of the dead, but because they don't believe in eternal life after this life. It would be a ceasing to exist. Um, but there's a large faction of Judaism, and the, 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 the sect that Jesus most aligned with believes in an eternal soul. Um, and I honestly would probably align more with the Jewish concept of, of heaven um, than I do the Christian concept of heaven. Um, because the Jewish concept of heaven is is soulish, that your soul is eternal, that you live on beyond this world. There's something eternal about you, um, and that lives on. And it lives on. The reward is not fluffy clouds and fat babies with wings playing harps. Um, the reward is God. That's the reward. It is existing in Him. That is this, this, this uh, pharisaical concept of, of a soul that exists beyond this life and it's either at peace with God and that is heaven or he's not at peace with God and that is hell or the, the negative side of that. And so Judaism is a little bit more complicated and really all belief systems are a little bit more complicated. You get into Christianity and you're going to have people that have veered from orthodoxy and believe in something called annihilation. So annihilation means that you just cease to exist, that when you die, you're annihilated. Um, there have been Christian theologians that have come and gone through the centuries that believe in annihilation. It's a very um, random um, a case where that happens, um, but there are some that believe in annihilation. That's not um, the way I read the word, and I feel like it's being bent to accommodate so we have these concepts of hell. Now let's hear the rabbi and what he says about it. We'll start in Revelations chapter uh, 21. So I read to you guys some, some word today. Where are we out on time? This may need to be a... I think we're good. Revelations chapter 21. I'm just going to start in verse 6. He also said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To, to the one who is thirsty, I will give water free of charge from the spring of life. Sound pretty good, right? Verse 7, the one who conquers will inherit these things. Still good. And I will be his God and he will be my son. Amazing. But, verse 8, as for the cowards, hmm, unbelievers, 
Detestable persons. Murderers. Homosexuals. No, it doesn't say homosexuals. It says the sexually immoral. I'm not saying homosexuality is not a sin, but it, it doesn't say that here. It says that sexual immorality. So we could demonize a people group all day while we're living and shacked up with our girlfriend, the most common sin of graduated Teen Challenge students. Let me just rebuke you now. It's sin. Put a ring on it. We're done living that life. Serve her. Love her. Wash her feet. Rub her feet. Work. Put in work. Bring home a check. Fry it up in a pan. Love your wife. You get the picture? But for cowards, unbelievers, detestable persons, murderers, sexually immoral, listen, don't categorize sin and make yourself better than you are. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So it talks about, in Revelations, this, this idea of eternity and eternal reward and eternal judgment. That is a scary thought. So where does it say these individuals go that are worshiping idols, that are, that are uh, practicing magic, that are unbelievers and murderers and sexually immoral? What are, what are happening to these people who are shacked up with their girlfriends after they graduate and they are not doing what the gospel tells them to do? This is to you, future adulterer. What is our lot? And all those who lie, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. That is the second death. Okay, death's just a form of punishment of, of the fallen sin. But what is this second death you speak of? Dying once is good enough. We speak of second life all the time, right? To be born again, born once in utero through my mother's womb, born once into the kingdom of God. But there's a second death as well. And the sexually immoral, it says, will be found there. Whew, this is our rabbi. We should take note so we see a number of things. I'm going to skip through a, a, a bunch of uh, scripture here. The uh, first thing we're going to see in John chapter 8, verse 21. In John chapter 8, uh, verse 21, it's going to talk about the wicked that die in their sins. And so there's this idea, and I even had it as a boy. Of course, as a boy, man, I was, my pastor scared the hell out of me, literally. Um, I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to die there. Uh, but that is... is I always had this idea, John chapter 8, verse 21, that I could like repent just in time. Anybody here raised in church? Got a few of it. Any of you think you got left behind? The rapture came and you were left behind? You got one. We got one Pentecostal kid back there. His, his grandpa scared to death out of him when he was a kid. The second death. Hmm. That the wicked die in their sins. So John's going to highlight that. So I had this idea like I could hear the trumpet blast. Do, do, do. Lord, forgive me on my sin. I'm sorry, Jesus. Boom, into heaven. Like I could, or I could live my life. We hear that a lot, especially from guys who live, have lived in addiction. Like, yeah, you know, I'm going to get right one day. Someday I'm, I'm going to get right. It's going to be okay. I, I, it's going to be okay. I'm young right now. It might not be okay. The, die, the, the wicked die in their sin. John chapter 8. Let me read that verse. Uh, John chapter 8 verse 21. Then Jesus said to them, Again, I am going away. So Jesus is saying he's going away. They're going to have a problem with this too. They don't understand where he's talking about going. They think he's going to kill himself. Some of the people do. And you will look for me, but will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So he's speaking of a place beyond this world. Our teacher is speaking of a place beyond this world. A good place and an evil place. And it says here that you will look for me and you will die in your sins. It also says in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, something very similar to this. Let me read that to you. Hebrews chapter 9. Quite a few scriptures here today. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27.
And just as people are appointed to die once and then to face judgment, so also after Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly await him, he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation. So here we have, it is appointed once for a man to die, and then what? Purgatory? No. That's not what it says. It is appointed for man to die. What happens after death? What happens beyond death's door? Jesus says it's appointed for man to die. But then he speaks in Revelation of a second death. And then he speaks of what happens immediately after death. Your mama can't pay your way out. That's a grievous act of the the Roman Catholic Church in the early years was the selling of what they call indulgences. That if your family member is in what they call purgatory, a holding cell before you get to heaven, which is not real, that if you paid enough money, you could pay their way out of purgatory and into heaven. That was being taught from the Catholic pulpit. It's a problem. There is nothing in between death and judgment. There is only judgment. It says you will die in your sins. Romans 6.23 says what? The wages of sin is death. But, aren't you glad there's a but? The gift of God is eternal life. He doesn't doesn't leave us there. So we see that the wicked die in their sin. There's not this holding place. Now, what we have is a pre-crucifixion, resurrection situation that it speaks of. Abraham's bosom and Sheol. These two holding compartments, which which is where they get the concept of purgatory. And pre-crucifixion, death of Christ, it says that there is Abraham's bosom where the righteous are kept and Sheol where the wicked are kept. Don't get me trying to explain the dynamics and all the intricacies of those places. The Bible doesn't speak very much on it. Talks about the the rich man, uh, Lazarus, that dies and he's in Sheol and he sees a great chasm, which is interesting. It appears to be the same holding place, but two sections within the whole same holding place. One for righteous and one for evil. So much so that this guy is looking over a great divide and he sees into heaven and he's talking to Abraham. And he's asking him questions. And he he ultimately wants him to dip his finger in the water and just cool his tongue while he is tormented in Sheol. At one point he says, go and tell my family members. Go and tell them not to come here. They don't want to be here where I'm at. Go tell them. What does Abraham say? They have the prophets just like you did. They've got the preachers standing behind pulpits at Teen Challenge just like you did. I've already sent them messengers. They stoned him and threw him out of the temple. They punched him in the mouth and and said, prophesy, prophet. I sent him messengers. One after another. Uh, One group they beat and threw out. Another group they gave a head injury. Another group, he sends his only son and he killed the son and they throw him out. What more do you want him to do to appeal to you? What more could he give than his only son? Wicked die in their sin. The wicked are not annihilated. There is no holding place anymore. There's speculation as to what happens um, after Christ's death and um, the speculation that, that here he, he robs hell. We see a resurrection happen after this um, where saints are actually coming out of the ground. Read the Bible. It's It's, it's wild. That this monumental moment happens of Christ's resurrection. He, something is happening during those three days in the tomb where he is preaching, the Bible says, to spirits formerly held in captivity. It appears to be people that are in these holding places. Now, I'm not going to create a doctrine about it and I'm not going to write a book about it because that's about as far as I can go into it because it is a mystery and there are very few scriptures that, that speak on the distinctions of those holding places. And I think it, it's in, there's a reason for that because it doesn't matter. You're appointed to die, then purgatory. No. You're appointed to die, then the judgment. You can't be prayed out of of that place because it doesn't exist. They are not annihilated. They are not in holding. 
The Bible speaks of it as punishment. Matthew uh, chapter 18. Now I'm going to skip through quite a few uh, uh, scriptures here, so uh, bear with me as we get all the scriptural, uh, the context here. But we will look at uh, Matthew chapter 18. Got tons of markers here, so I could be quick. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 8 is where we'll start. Matter of fact, let me start in 6. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, talking about children, it would be better for him to hang a millstone around his neck. We know what a millstone is. We went through Gethsemane in the press and how big those stones are. And to be drowned in the open sea. <laughs> they felt pretty, pretty serious about child abuse here. Put a stone on your neck and throw you in the ocean. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. It is necessary that stumbling blocks come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Whoa, wait a minute. I, 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 I like my foot. Cut it off and throw it, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. Eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, throw it away from you. It is better that you enter into life with one eye than that you have two and that you're thrown into the fiery pit of hell. How do you get rid of that scripture? How do you get rid of the judgment of God? How do you get rid of hell? I desperately want to. But I can't honestly look at God's word and do that. That It's talking about it so graphically. Just think about that. It's the same impact that it has today that it would have had back then. Go get you a good saw and sharpen it in your wood shop and go to hacking on your foot. Take your finger, dig it in your eye socket, and rip your eye out. Why do we make these things religious in, in nature and terms? And No, he's saying rip your eye from its socket. And then just give it a good tug so that it breaks loose. That's how violent he wants you to look at the concept of lust that invades your heart and poisons you. So much so. That it is better for you to enter heaven with no eyes, no feet, no legs. Call me torso man. It's better to be a torso in heaven than to have all your members and burn in hell for the rest of your lives. That's what he's saying. Can I say it more violently? He doesn't. Hacking your foot off is violent. Ripping your eye from his socket is violent. Taking an axe to your hand is violent. Is he giving a prescription to go lop off members? No. He's drawing a, a juxtaposition between two things. Heaven and hell. Eternity and life or in death. And he wants to get your attention. So much so that he says, look at your hand. Cut it off. Somebody tell me that our rabbi is not serious. And tell me you can make that mean something else. I want it to. But all I can do is fall on my knees humbly before God and say, God, help me. Because I'm a sinner. And I wander. And my eyes wander. And my feet wander. And my heart wanders day after day. Bring me back to you. God, pluck my eye out if necessary. Chop my leg off. If necessary, if it keeps me close to your bleeding side, teach me to depend on you, to cling to you, to preach truth regardless of how it makes me feel. It talks about an everlasting fire, an unquenchable fire. It talks about pain in, in Matthew uh, chapter 8. Let me read that for you. Matthew chapter 8 verse 12, notable to look at Jesus speaking in Matthew 8. I'll start in verse 11. I tell you, many will come from the east into the west to share at the banquet with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now, where are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? They're dead when Jesus is saying this. There's life after death. 
Why is he talking about sitting down and having a banquet with Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham? Hey, Abraham, can you pass me the, the butter? Can you pass me the unleavened bread? Can you pass me the hummus, Yeshua? Come on, somebody. It's going to be a good time. <laughs> Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac, man, talk to me, Isaac. Tell me what it was like walking up that mountain with your dad. When did you realize? Come on, somebody. Jason, you're going to have a good time up there, man. Just asking questions, sitting at people's feet. <laughs> the beauty of Scripture revealed. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are there. Where are they? Well, they're dead at the time Jesus is saying that. So where are they? In the kingdom of heaven, he says. At the end of verse 11. But the sons of the kingdom, this kingdom, will be thrown out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What is this? Weeping. Number one, hell is, is eternal. It's, it's, uh, it's represented in eternal fire, in torture. It's represented in pain. It's represented in regret. We see as Lazarus, um, not the one that was raised from the dead, but the rich man is pleading because he has regret that his sons don't know and he wants to send messengers. There's regret, there's sorrow, there's pain. Now it's speaking of gnashing of teeth. I don't know what this was about me and my acid trips back in the day, but all I ever saw when acid trips started going bad, and when acid trips started going bad, they was all bad. It was like, I would try it again and be like, nope, can't do this anymore. It's a bad idea. But I would always see when they started going bad, gnashing teeth, just growling, just looking at me. As I was sitting there, a wayward child away from God, running from my calling. I would just see gnashing teeth all around me, just grimacing and looking at me like they wanted to kill me. The gnashing of teeth represents pain. This, this grinding of your teeth. Anybody ever grind your teeth? Some of you lost them because you ground them down to nothing. I don't, just grind and just... Ugh. Why? Because we were in pain, man. Our souls were tormented. They were unsettled. They were disconnected. And inside we were just, we weren't even comfortable in our own skin. You want more of that? Whew. You want more of that uneasiness inside of you? That death and decay? My friend, that is a form of, of punishment. That is a form and a result of sin. But my friend, that's just a taste from what I read in Scripture Jesus talks about. Where there is gnashing of teeth 24-7 eternally. There's pain. Hebrews chapter 6. Let me read you Hebrews chapter 6. If I can, I got so many scriptures on here. If I can uh, relocate here. No, I'm going to skip that one. Okay, uh, Jude chapter uh, 1 verse 1 verse 6. This is going to speak of um, eternal chains. Oops, I just jumped to Hebrews 6. I had it mislabeled. Sorry. Hebrews 6 verse 7. Let me read that. For the ground that has soaked up the rain that frequently... Did I just read the right? Hebrews 6, 7. That is right. Frequently falls on it and yields useful vegetables. What? Is this the right... Okay, so yeah, at the end of that, verse 8 is where I was pulling, full, pulling from. But it, if it produces thorns and thistles, it is useless and about to, to be cursed. Its fate is to be burned. Um, so yeah, so just the end of this, and you're going to see this, but I could do this on all of these parables. We could get to the end of the parables where the doors are barred and the people are left outside of the banquet hall where it says where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's, there's parable after parable that talks about the end of this judgment. That the, the vineyard owners that throw out the, 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 the ones that are coming to collect and ultimately kill the son, that ultimately they're bound, thrown out of the vineyard into outer darkness. That every one of these ends with either reward or punishment. And this one was no different. Damnation, the word damnation in, in its Greek context here is accusation, condemnation, judgment and justice for wicked deeds. The last uh, scripture I want to read to you is from Mark uh, chapter 9. Let me read that for you. Mark chapter 9, and we'll start in 
around verse 47. Mark 9, starting in verse 47. So, uh, really the same interaction here of, of, of the cutting off of members. But yeah, getting down, let me um, end with verse 47. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. And it, it is better to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two and to be thrown into hell. Um, this word hell here is the reason to bring out this scripture. The, the common word we most understand, torment after life, um, being, being hell. Um, where, there, where the worm, and this is really what I want to end with, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. The fire is never quenched. There is no relief where the worm doesn't die. Matthew Henry believes this worm to be the reflection of the sinner's conscience as the worm that dieth not, which cleaveth to the damned soul as the worm is due to the dead body and prey upon it and never leave it until it is quite devoured this worm that doesn't die there's been speculation as to what this is and i would concur with matthew henry that this worm doesn't die that doesn't die is regret that weaves in and out of your rotting body and reminds you now me me end by saying this i'm not talking about a place that that is the quintessential uh, lake of fire with a with a devil with a red suit and a pitchfork. As Coulter Wall, the, the country artist, says, the devil, he wears a suit and a tie. That heaven is not this ethereal cloud city. It's not where Lando Calrissian rules. Star Trek, Star Wars nerds out there, nobody? Cloud City is not heaven. There is a beauty to heaven that we cannot comprehend, an understanding of who God is, that we will be known and we will know Him as we are known, that the joy of heaven is Him, but the, the, the pain and torment of hell is not Him. Let me say that again. But the joy of heaven, he is the reward. And I would agree with Judaism in that. I do believe there is a physical body that is raised um, to a new life. And I do believe there's a new earth. And we could talk about a new earth and the new heaven. But today we're talking about hell. And in the same way I don't believe there's this cloud city, I don't envision hell like that. I envision hell as the absence of God. Yes, there is torment. Yes, everything we read is true. Yes, there is pain. Yes, there is regret. Yes, there is judgment. But the ultimate pain of hell is not having Him. You've experienced just a a grain of that living in addiction, being ostracized from Him, being disconnected like I told you about in your soul and broken inside as you gnashed your teeth down to nothing. The pain ultimate pain of hell in my opinion is because he is nowhere to be found and though we search for him though we claw at the door though we beat on the ground he will not be found Jesus says you will search for me and you will die in your sin my friend I don't say this with a An easy light heart today. I say it because it convicts my own heart. Mm -hmm. Because I know that deep inside I can wander at a moment's second. And I can fall from grace because I have. God, keep me close to your side. My friend, I pray that you find him. And you cling to him on this earth. And cling to him until you cling to him forever. In eternity. And you disappear into who he is. May it not be, you not be found and the doors barred while we beat and ask for him to answer. Because by then it will be too late. Let's bow our heads.
God, forgive me for taking lightly eternity. So many times, so many days, I get up, I punch the clock, and I run through the motions. When I read these passages, it causes me to stop, and there's alarm clocks going off, and, and red lights, and it screams that I need to pay attention, that this is life and death, and it's not a game. That eternity is forever. God, would you bring us close to you? Cut off a leg if possible and if necessary, but keep us close to your side and never let us go. God, today we pray for anyone here who is wavering between two opinions. God, we, we ask that you reach them where they are, set them free, change their hearts, and set them on a course and a trajectory that will put them exactly where you want them, in the center of your hand and close to your side. God, we pray for those today. Lord, we thank you for the reward that is you, the glory that is you, and that we get to taste that here, right now. It's the thing that angels desperately long to look into because they're mesmerized by the beauty of our salvation and the joy of sitting at your feet and why you lavish so much love on such a perverse, broken people. God, we embrace you today and we repent of our sin and we cling to you. Keep us by your side and may we always say, you will never let us go. Leave, never leave us or forsake us. In Jesus' precious name, amen, 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 amen. God bless you guys.